Um, so welcome to uh, this event at Bantry House. Um, I'm Rachel Andrews and this is John Connell, author of The Running Book. Um, so we're just going to, John will do a reading um, in a minute and then we'll have a chat um, about the book and there'll be time for audience questions as well at the end. Um, so I'm just going to introduce John before he uh, reads a little. Um, John Connell's work has been published in Granta's new Irish writing issue. His memoir, The Cow Book, was a number one bestseller in Ireland and was Ireland AM popular non-fiction book of the year at the 2018 on Post Irish Book Awards. He's a multi-award winning investigative journalist and editor, a film producer and playwright. He lives on his family par farm, Birchview, in County Longford, Ireland. Welcome, John. Thank you. So, I, the I book. like a great author, didn't bring my own <laughs> copy of my own book. Uh, and I only thought of it on the four and a half hour drive down to Cork. <laughs> Luckily, uh, we were organised. <laughs> yes. Uh, I'm going to read uh, just a little bit of the opening chapter, um, give you a flavour of the book. Um, uh, so it's called Undiscovered Lands. I've never ran this far before. I'm 30 and this is all new to me. I'm running now as though everything depends on it, and in so many ways, it does. This run, this voyage, is in ways the climax of a journey into the country of the self, the final destination after a year of traveling. I'm thinking of all this, but really I'm just putting one foot in front of the other and willing myself on, hoping to keep going because I've quit at so many things in my life, ran away from problems and people, but right now, this run is a way to make amends for all that. It might sound like magical thinking, and maybe in some way it is. All actions start in dreams and thoughts, and I've long held on to this one. I'm in the local forest of Derry Casson in rural Longford. It has snowed, and between the melting snow and puddles of water, I race now. My feet are wet, but I do not mind. My lungs are strong and firm, and I know and feel that at this pace, I can continue for a long time. An hour more, two hour more, I am not sure. This is an undiscovered country. A man once said to me, you get to know yourself on a long run. In the end, he surmised, you realize you're a lot stronger than you think and a lot more stubborn. These words are haunting me now. They are every one of them true. Running and farming are two things I understand, two tangible things. With each passing day, progress is made. The cultivation of a crop or cow is like the tending of the garden of the self. Not much happens in a week, but in the culmination of weeks and months, real progress is made, real goals achieved. Everything starts in dreams and thoughts, the building of a farm, the building of a body, the writing of a book. We are, I think, in a way, the heirs of our dreams. The sweat on my face has dried and turned to salt, and when I lick my lips, I can taste it. It has been several hours since I have drank water. At times, a craving comes to me for it, and then, like a lustful urge, it leaves again. I tell myself that soon, soon I will stop and give in. There is a river and lake beside me, beside this old forest. Perhaps when all this is over, I will jump in, quench and cool myself. I'll cup my hands and drink the water from the lake, fresh and clean like the old people did in the long ago. I am not the greatest runner, but I have in me the discipline of an athlete. Running and exercise have given me a control of my life, a real foundation on which to build, and from that the new man that I have become has been forged. They say running is a lonely thing, but out there on the road, on the roads of life, I have never felt more alive, more connected to the moment. There's Thanks, more, John. but then I'd be reading the whole book to you. So, <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so you just started there, I suppose. Um, we're, we kind of meet you when you're um, in the middle or at the starting point of kind of a long run. So mm. This is a long run. And that seems to be how you structured the book, with a kind of like a sort of a... Run, um, you know, the, the structure of a long run and then digressing and weaving in and out of other... Yeah, yeah. Um, I suppose it's a it's a it's it's forty two thousand words long. It's forty two chapters. It's um the it's the kilometer distance of a marathon, and I'm running a marathon, uh, so uh, that was the device uh, that was it was suggested to me actually by my agent, and um, I, I thought it was a good idea, and uh, yeah, so it was that was the that was the way to do it, and then the diversions, I had been starting the book several times and trying to figure out how to do it 
and I'd had in my head uh, to write a book that was about uh, my great passion of running, but also about history and colonialism. And I thought, madly, I suppose, <laughs> that I could connect the two, and uh, that the diversions would, would, that it would flow like a stream of consciousness, really, that when you're on a long run or a long walk, uh, that uh, you, your mind wanders, and you think about everything, really. You think about life. You don't just think about one foot in front of the other. Um, and I think that was kind of uh, what I was aiming to do. And uh, I had been watching um, a documentary series by Adam Curtis called The Power of Nightmares, which was about how the Allies had constructed the narrative of World War II after the war had ended. And um, because nobody knew really what the war was fully about in the present moment of the war. Yeah. So I wanted to kind of, that really influenced me about how do we structure narrative after the events have happened. Ah, I see. And so did you actually do that, that run I in did. preparation for the book? I did, yeah, yeah. I, I did the run. Uh, I did the run in Longford and um, then I was in Spain and I started the book and then a friend said to me, do you, do you want to come to Los Angeles to finish your book? And uh, so I actually wrote the majority of the book in America oh. and uh, just kind of reliving the same day again and I had my notes obviously on my phone and stuff. So uh, that was how it happened. Yeah, I, I did an interview before and someone was surprised to know that it was <laughs> I was in America writing about Longford. <laughs> but uh, yeah, that's where I was. So. The distance, yeah. yeah. And I mean, um, so there is, um, when we talk about the digressions, you're talking there about history, and there is a lot of history in the book. And there's also, I suppose, attention to the landscape, really, and this, mm. the, this sort of idea of the, of the, um, the memories uh, that are sort of embedded into the land. Um, and were those were two areas that you had sort of wanted to write about in terms of your own place, Longford. Yeah, I think it's probably I started that journey with the cow book talking about one specific place, which was just the farm. And then I wanted to build out that world for um, for Banalee, where I'm from, then, then Longford, and then the wider world, I suppose. But yeah, landscape is something that um, really sort of connected me to, to the thing. And then the notion that... Um, there is a narrative to landscape that it holds stories and memories. Um, and, uh, you know, there's a line in the book, I say, the sheep and the cows look at the, look at the landscape and they, they know it for its, its hills and, and nooks and crannies and where, where the water drinkers are, but they, they'll never know the full story of, uh, you know, what happened 100 years ago, 200 years ago. And I al uh, whenever I'm asked that, I always remember how my father pointed out to the little hills beside us, and he said the Redcoats marched the 1798 rebels across these hills. And, um, you know, that has come from a lived memory, a living memory of my family looking at this happening. And, uh, you know, if it wasn't, I, I mentioned it in the book, but if it wasn't recorded, it would be just gone, you know? And uh, so I'm kind of fascinated with, with the, um, yeah, with the connection that we put on place yeah. uh, in, in this country in particular. Yeah. But, uh, um, you know, there is, there's a writer, W.G. Seabald, who wrote The Rings of Saturn, and he went for a walk in Sussex, and uh, it's a similar thing, you know, the, the stories of the places are there, but then you come in with your own point of view and you, 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 um, you add more layers to it. Yeah. That's so interesting because it did remind me a bit of Sebald. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> so he, yeah, he, he walks around this in Plymouth, isn't he? Yeah, yeah, exactly, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. It's yeah. very kind of nondescript in some ways. You'd think there wouldn't be much there, but there's huge amounts of stories and history, etc. Yeah, totally. And yeah. he called it, the subtitle for that book was An English Pilgrimage, uh, which I always thought was really interesting because he was German himself. So, yeah. Um, yeah. It was a great book. If you haven't read it, it's a great <laughs> book, Rings of Saturn. So, But it seems it's really interesting to me, um, I suppose, the uncovering of all of this, this history and the, these memories in that, in that space in Longford. It's almost like you're um, sort of deep mapping the landscape or something, you know? Yeah, I mean, um, I suppose uh, the cow book had been such a success uh, that I was, I, I remember Richard Flanagan, a writer who I 
greatly admire said he was allowed to take a literary gamble. <laughs> and uh, I think that's essentially what I did with this book. I said, I'm going to write about something that I'm really passionate about and, uh, and, and, um, and give it a go. Um, and uh, yeah, I think, you know, uh, there isn't many books that have been wrote about Longford. Uh, there isn't many stories. Uh, people in Longford know the stories, but other people don't. And I just kind of wanted to um, put that down on paper, that uh, on the history side of things, that it would be remembered. And there was things I didn't know when I started writing the book that I l later learned, and uh, like the baseball player from Granard and things like that. So it was, um, yeah, it was an opportunity to, to uh, to document um, mm. and preserve, and that it would be there for uh, it would be there for another person to come along and go. Oh, okay. I, I suppose I was interested in what Tim Robinson did in 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 uh, in Connemara, and uh, I've wrote another book now, which is is also set in Longford. Uh, it's the final book in this Longford trilogy, and um, I suppose. Uh, that's my gift to where I'm yeah, from. Yeah, so, so interesting, just staying in that one place and really, really spending time with it. Yeah, yeah. like I, I've been back in Ireland since 2015, so um, uh, I didn't intend to to write three <laughs> memoirs or three books about Longford, but that's just the way it went, you know? So, yeah. uh, but I have nothing more to say, so it's fine now <laughs> after this, I'm, I'm done saying things. So <laughs> I'll, write, I'll write some fiction, so yeah. <laughs> Where did you do the research? Because like there's a lot of stuff there that's quite detailed. So how did you? Where did you come across? Well, it all? there was a book uh, that was done. Um, oh, I think around 2000s, early 2000s, called the History of Longford, and it was done by. It, it was a. It was an initiative by various counties uh, to do a history of each county, and it was essays from academics, some from Longford, some from over from other counties and indeed some people from overseas. And uh, I'd been reading that book for, since I wrote the cow, since I was writing the cow book. And then other parts of it, I just knew the stories. My father's very big into history, so I would have grown up with some of the stories. And then other ones just kind of um, presented themselves. Like I was talking about the, 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 um, the baseball player from Granard. Um, I didn't know about him. Uh, I suppose the one thing people know about Granard and Longford is Anne Lovett, and I wrote about that, and then I said, oh, geez, I need something happier here. And I'm very interested in Walt Whitman, and Walt Whitman um, loved baseball, and it turns out that there was a young fella from Granard who was, who was born in Granard, and his family emigrated to America, and he ended up playing for Boston, and Walt Whitman was doing um, uh, reports on the games. So I said... It's, an, it's amazing that the two of them were around at the same time, and he said, and Walt Whitman loved baseball, so he would have seen this guy from Longford play baseball. And not only did he play baseball, he was actually really good at it. Uh, so it was just, and there's no statue to him or anything like that. And even Field Marshal Wilson in, in, in Balnali, who was, um, who was the chief of staff of the British Army, uh, there's no statue to him or plaque or anything in, in, in my village. And, uh, you know, he was a very, very famous figure. But uh, I'd have would have grown up he her hearing stories about him, and then went off and did the research. So a lot of it was local knowledge, and then just deep diving into into books and uh, going to the county archive, and of course the internet. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And in terms of the running, then I mean, there was you touch on running a little in the cow book. Mm. So was it something that was just sort of that you wanted to expand on? Yeah, I, I am. Um, like the book is dedicated to Stephen Ray, and Stephen and I talk a lot about colonialism and history in the past and the British Empire. Stephen Ray, the actor. Stephen yeah. Ray, the actor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. and uh, and um, I suppose I had said to him I'd wrote the cow book. This is before the cow book had even come out, actually. Uh, and I said to him, I'm writing this new book about um, running, and uh, it's going to tie the two together. And um, I suppose I was conscious of what Seabelt had done with Rings of Saturn. So I said, it is possible to tie the two things together. And uh, running is just something that I, I really love. And as someone who had suffered with mental health issues, it was a way to uh, get a control on my life. So it is a big part of my life. 
and it's a big part of my identity. And um, I suppose it was a passionate subject. Um, so it was easy to write because uh, it's something I do nearly every single day and have done for seven years. So yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. but running was, um, yeah, I don't know. If you ask me now why I wrote the book, I couldn't yeah. tell you, you know, but it was, it was just something that I was very passionate about and, uh, and, and uh, connected to. And uh, I just thought it was a way, it was a different sort of a way to, to, to talk about home. Yeah, through movement. Because, like, apart from the history and the attention to the surrounds, I mean, there's quite a lot about running in the book in terms of preparation, shoes, and you do talk a lot about some of the athletes who have inspired you as well. Yeah, I, I think um, that was done, speaking about the athletes was done to break up the story, but I kind of found some of the, some of the athletes' stories are so... Um, so touching and so heartbreaking. I mean, I'm, I'm conscious of uh, even the American sprinter who was disqualified uh, for the Tokyo Olympics two, a week ago. Oh, uh, really? Who, who has been training for years. She's the American champ and uh, her mother died and she, she had a joint and now she's, um, she's oh. gone. And she said, uh, you know, or it was, it was noted that, you know, that weed was, was legal in many of the states where she was. And, you know, a silly mistake has ruined her whole career. And, I, I, and funny enough, athle athletics can be like that. Uh, John Akibuya, who was a Ghanaian hurdler, um, missed his chance for a second gold when Idi Amin, um, Idi Amin, the dictator, said we're not participating in the Olympics this year as a boycott. And he was considered the greatest uh, Olympic hurdler there has ever been. And Robert Moses won instead. And Robert Moses is now remembered as the greatest hurdler of all time, not John Akibuya. So um, I, I found their stories very human. And uh, a Cork native uh, here, I, I met Sonia Sullivan, and we've become sort of friends. And I remember talking to her in Cove last year, and I said, you know, what goes through your head when you're in a big race? And, she, and, and I was expecting that she'd say, oh, I'm totally meditative and I'm, I'm in the zone. She said, everything goes through uh -huh, your head. I'm really? a human being, you know? And, and, I, was, and I, I said, wow. I said, oh, I felt really, uh, I felt very connected in that moment. I said, oh, oh even the greats have to, have to <laughs> battle their minds, you know? And it's yeah. as much about the mind as it is about... Physical fitness can only get you so far. It's your mind, really, after that. So I was kind of fascinated by the psychology of all that and the stories of the people. And, you know, there was... There was runners who I didn't include, uh, who, I, who who I probably should have, but um, uh, like I, re I referenced Sonia, but I didn't tell her story because I just assume because uh, everybody knows Sonia's story. So I wanted in an in a way to to talk about some of the lesser known greats uh, that hopefully would inspire people. Yeah, and you talk about Paula Radcliffe a bit. I do talk about Paula yeah. Radcliffe, and Paula is um, well. It was funny actually because she, when I was writing the book, she still held the world record, and then when it came to the publishing of the book, it had just been really, beaten, yeah, So, yeah. and it had stood for something like 13 years, uh, which is a hell of a long time in athletics. But um, yeah, Paula's, what I loved about Paula's story was that um, she actually came to marathon running uh, much later. She tried other things, and that was a, that was a thing. Um, even Elliot Kipchoge, who, who, um, who broke the sub two-hour marathon, he started off as a... It's amazing, actually. I, 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 the, his life story is about failure. Um, and he was trying to be a short distance. I think it was 800-meter runner. And he, he was on the team for, for Kenya and then got caught, tried to qualify again for another race, got caught. And his Olympic dreams were actually over at 25. And then um, he, for so, I think he must have went into the dark for a while. And then about six months later, he re-emerges and he does a half marathon and wins. And then uh, out of this total failure, dropped from all the teams, no sponsors, nothing, he, deci he decides for some reason to become a marathon runner. And now he's the greatest marathon runner of all time. And I think in a way, it reminded me of being a writer because... Um, the cow book that the book that had that launched me was actually my last book. I had given up. Oh and, no! Uh, really? Wow. Yeah, I'd given up, and I said, "This is this is my last attempt at being a writer." And uh, and then if it, 
I had wrote some other books that had been rejected. And, and I think if, I ha if they hadn't have been rejected, I wouldn't have wrote the cow book. So it's amazing how life can... Um, ca failure is the best teacher, you know? Uh, failure is the one that, that shows you that... Uh, that maybe there's, maybe you should approach the thing in a different angle. And I just I, I was writing an article about Kipchoge uh, earlier in the year, and I, and, I, and, that, and that's what I said. I said if it wasn't for his failure, he would the world would never have known the greatest marathon runner of all time. Um, and it's all by chance, you know. And and I and I'd say that um, for him, he was probably no more than Paula. There was probably a dark moment and uh, wondering where do I go from here. And then they found uh, the invincible summer inside themselves. Yeah. You know? yeah. yeah. And I think you have a bit in the book that says failure or something. It's like a little sh section uh, yes, of failure. I do. Uh, <laughs> I can't remember what it was. <laughs> it's roughly that. It's roughly that. Failure is the best yeah, teacher. Fa yeah. Failure is the best teacher. It was like Beckett said, you know, fail again, fail better. But uh, um, I can't, uh, what is it? I, I can't go on or I, I must go, <laughs> I'll on. go on. I'll go on. Yeah. And I yeah. think that's it. It's, it's, it's like, um, yeah. Yeah, it's writing is a fascinating um, job, as you know yourself. But um, like, I finished uh, a book last summer, and uh, I haven't wrote anything since. And uh, I remember seeing Killian Murphy uh, at Boris Festival uh, two years ago, and he he had done uh, Max Porter's "A Grief Griefs the Thing with Feathers," oh, yes, and, yeah. and they said, "What have you been doing?" And he said, "I haven't done anything." <laughs> and I was wondering. I said, "How could you not do anything? You know, that's that's ridiculous." And uh, and and here I am myself, and <laughs> I haven't done a, and I really enjoyed it. <laughs> yeah. You know, I really enjoyed taking a break, and uh, I think. Um, uh, I think it's good, actually, you know. Yeah, I think it's Rebecca Solnit. She says, like, writing is thinking, is walking, is research, you know, yeah, all of that stuff. Yeah. It's not necessarily just always writing. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And so, like, just in terms of that idea of failure and perseverance, it's kind of there at the end of the book as well, where you're kind of reaching the end of the marathon mm -hmm. and you're hitting the wall. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's... Uh, um, yeah, that's a really, um, it's a while since I run a marathon. I run a half marathon every month and uh, just keep my fitness up. And uh, some days, you know, the wall is five kilometers. It doesn't have to be 42. Yeah. And uh, I think, you know, you can run the same track every day and be a completely different person each day. And, you know, to a person who doesn't exercise, it seems like a very... Uh, strange thing to be doing the same track every day and it looks like just repetition but actually there's so much more to it but but hitting the wall i think not just in in um in running but also in life is uh we have to get you know the athletes talk about flow state and in a sense you have to get into flow state whether it's work or uh, i was i was i was at a, a wedding at the weekend and and um i was talking to a chap who who cycles bikes, uh, mountain bikes, uh, in, in, on trails. And he said, you know, once you're in flow state, he said, you can, he said, you know, you can do things. He said, but it takes a long time to get there. Yeah. And, and the wall in running is about trying to break through that and finding the tools to get you through it. And I think, you know, even the line I said in the, in the beginning there, how um, you get to know yourself on a long run. And really, for me, those long distances, I, I have to find a reason to keep going, whether it's a bit of stubbornness or or that you want to be able to tell someone you've done this. Uh, I think it's it's those motivations. You have to find um, the mental strength uh, inside you. And I think, I think running gives you a discipline that um, you can, you can uh, use in other aspects of your life. Yeah, hopefully. And do you, like, do you, are you put off by the weather or anything? <laughs> it's easy to in Ireland. Uh, yeah, no I, I, no, I don't mind it. It's, it's, um, it's just, it sounds like it's going to rain here. <laughs> 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 it, it's, uh, you know, it, it's just part of life here. Yeah. And uh, in the winter, I do go to the gym and stuff. But um, no, I, I, I generally, one gets prepared for it. And uh, I think that... Um, if you wanted an excuse, there's always uh, there's always one every day. You can always find some excuse for yourself. 
so it's just a case of saying, well, look, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go and do this now and make the most of it. And uh, in fact, some of the days when it is cold or snowy or raining are some of the best days because you're, you're on your own and yeah. you can just get out there and get away from it all. And uh, um, don't like when it's completely bucketed now. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not a total madman. You can always <laughs> come back and have a hot shower. Though. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and. Um, just in terms of the structure of the book as well, well, we've talked a bit about that, but the apart from the structure of kind of the marathon, like you have a lot of quite short sections, I suppose, and that reminded me a bit of the structure of the cow book. Yeah, yeah. That, that's... Um, I suppose that's my style. It's like, um, I couldn't explain it. I wrote a novella about... Uh, it never was published or anything, but I wrote a novella about... Jackie Kennedy on um, Air Force One after, I know it's totally different, but wow. after, uh, after JFK had been shot. And I wrote, I, wrote, I realize now um, the style, I, I, I had, that was the start of that style of like short chapters. And in, in that novel, I used asterisks just to, just to get you through each section. It was about thoughts. Um, and I suppose the style sort of developed from there and it finally kind of got, um, not perfected, but molded in, in, in the cow book. And um, yeah, it's been a really, people have, have said that, oh, he writes in vignettes and stuff. And it's, yeah. it's really interesting. It's just sort of happened. I am also aware that people who read my books don't always have a lot of time. And so some of the chapters are short, so you can pick it up and leave it down. Um, and, and people have said that to me, they're like, I, I like how you write the chapters because I can read four in a night and I know I've, I might have only, maybe only read the six pages, but I know I've read a few chapters. Um, yeah. So uh, yeah, it was kind of a, it was a horse flag fly. on me, horse fly. Um, so it was kind of a, um, it's, 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 it's how I write now, yeah. 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 Um, and uh, I was writing a short story, uh, uh, a few weeks ago, and I, you know, I had to remind myself how to write fiction again, you know. So, because really? I'm so long doing yeah. this way wow. of writing, so yeah, yeah it's it's. Uh, but it was it, it was a way to, I suppose, explore different topics, um, and uh, and a way to, um, I suppose, bring the reader along on the journey. So you're not you're not confusing them too much by too many diversions. They're like, okay, this is going to be a chapter about the Andaman Islands or this is going to be a chapter about Abiba Bikala and you know what it is. You know yeah. what it is coming into it. So, And like your style, in terms of your style, I mean, the writing is quite, um, I would say, mind you, you come from journalism, so you probably have picked up that very sparse... <laughs> yeah. I, 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 the, Plain. The, the, I read... Um, I was trying to find my voice a few years ago and uh, when I came back and I was reading a lot of stuff and I start, and I read Cormac McCarthy and he's always talked about it, but I read him and uh, I liked how simple the writing was. And then uh, uh, the English writer John Berger is a favorite of mine and he's not really in vogue anymore, but um, uh, it, He's known in certain circles, but he's, he wrote the Pig Earth trilogy, which is about farming laborers, and uh, he wrote Ways of Seeing. And I always liked John's style. I actually wrote to him before he died. And no way. Yeah, and he wrote back. Did and you everything. write back? He wrote oh. back. Yeah, yeah. He wrote back, and uh, which was really I loved. I loved oh, that's that. That's wonderful. And, uh, yeah. yeah, it was. Um, yeah, those sort of those two things really sort of started to um, influence my style, and I just said. I was going to try and simplify things a bit, and uh, um, it's strange, you know. Like I'd, I'd Richard Flanagan, uh, who I now know, uh, and he won the Booker Prize. He talked about uh, being on the Franklin River in Tasmania, and he nearly drowned. And he said that uh, he knew when he was dying that if he lived, he'd become a writer, and. I had went through uh, a very bad period of depression and a uh, terrible time. And I, I came out of it and I said, I'm going to be a writer. <laughs> and I've just been writing since then. And, and I think it was 
the books that kept me going and the, the motivation of of having a book and, and, and the dream and all that and, and the right the words I can't really articulate it much much better Rachel because the words just kind of came and that they've they've been coming for seven years you know so it's just kind of a um, yeah it's a fascinating and is thing, it you like know? do you find like because your style is very clear and very kind of plain and very simple, but I imagine it's deceptively simple. Like, I'm just wondering about the work yeah, <laughs> that goes it's, into making it's, it. It's, um, I, I kind of, um, I get into a zone and uh, I write and I suppose running has taught me the discipline uh, that I have in that I'll get up in the morning, I'll work for a few hours and then I'll go for a run or I'll look at the cows or whatever it is and that's it for the day. And I, like Hemingway said, I always leave a little bit of work for myself in the morning, so I'm not facing a blank page. I know what I need to do. And uh, when I'm in that space, I'm probably the happiest I am in life when I'm in that space, and I, I know other writers are the same, because you know what the, wor what the work is and you know what you're doing. And um, it just sort of uh, comes. And, and in a way, um, you know, the running book, I think I had to write it so that I could write the next book, and uh, it, it was um, like Murakami obviously wrote what I talk about when I talk about running, and that's hi him coming as close to talking about himself. And even though I write memoirs, this one was really personal, you know. Yeah. That's, uh, yeah. Um, didn't think you'd write, you'd, I could make a whole book out of <laughs> running, but there we go. <laughs> well, <laughs> you know? he did, so why he not? Did, yeah, yeah, so why not? And, uh, but it, yeah, it was just sort of a, yeah, it was just sort of a, uh, had to come, you know. Yeah. Um, some books you have to write, you know. Yeah, uh, yeah. I'm no, beginning great. to learn that, so. Yeah. And the the next book, do you want to talk about that? or? Uh, well, there's a, uh, I'll have a bit of news on that in a few weeks, <laughs> so uh, I can't say anything yet, but uh, I, I wrote it uh, last summer. And, uh, oh, um, in lockdown. In lockdown. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, it'll be, it'll be, we'll, we'll have an announcement on it in a few weeks, actually. So, great. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. I'll be looking forward to sharing that one. <laughs> and just in terms, in the, in the book, you talk about, you talk about the book of runs, I think that's what you say. Yeah. Like some of the great the runs. The great runs, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I, in the book, I talk about running the Cliffs of Moher from Doolan to the end of the cliffs and back. It's about 30 odd kilometers. And uh, yeah, I just, some, some days, um, I, I'm not a pint man anymore. I used to be a pint man or a pint baby and, uh, and go and drink pints, but I don't drink anymore. And running is kind of my, um, that's my form of, of, of having, a, having the bit of crack. And uh, some days it's just, they're just wonderful days, you know? And, but funny enough, I started doing walks as well. And I, I had a, I had a beautiful walk in, in the Dingle Peninsula on the Cusson, the nave, uh, the, the, the St. Brendan pilgrimage across the Dingle Peninsula. And, and I said to myself, well, I'm going to have to let that into the Book of Runs now because uh, it was such a good day. <laughs> but yeah, it's just some days th things are right. You go for a long run and uh, you, you just feel totally connected with everything. And um, the Cliffs of Moher, I had been writing the cow book Sorry, I, I was living the life. I was working on the farm, and my friend Duncan came from Australia. And uh, in a, it, there'd been a big um, there'd been a big fight on the farm. So him arriving was really good. It kind of gave me an excuse to go. And I'd never seen the cliffs of Moher, so we end up. We both said he ran too, and we both said, "Should we run them?" And it was a bloody difficult <laughs> task. Now it's a long run. But, um, and did he run it? Was that that one? He ran it. He ran, he, away, he ran yeah. it with me. Yeah, yeah, he ran it with me and uh, ran ran much faster than yeah. me. But um, it was just uh, just just a perfect day. Mm. And uh, I kind of said to myself, you know, you have to bank the good days. You have to remember the good days because uh, there's lots of days when it's just humdrum. Do this, do that. Uh, get up, have the dinner, go to bed, and. Uh, you have to enjoy and remember those good days. And the Book of Runs was, was, was one of the titles of this, but then someone reminded me that it sounded a bit 
rude. So, uh, oh, <laughs> <laughs> so I said, yes, very good point there. Yeah, yeah. Could yeah. They make uh, that point, it could be yeah. something else. <laughs> but um, yeah, so it's it's uh, it was a really. Um, and there's one yeah. in Spain as well. Was that your first yes, marathon? Yes, my first marathon in Spain. I was in Ibiza and um, that was hard. Uh, that was really and hard. And, I, and it was hot. Yeah. And I did it without water breaks. I was just running myself, you know. And, uh, and then I met this Spanish guy who was running. I'd started the run with a friend. Um, uh, and um, it was actually when I was writing the cow book, I was in Spain writing the cow book, and I did this marathon when I was in Spain. So that's how it ended Without up in this water. book. And oh my, uh, God. And, uh, my friend had started the day with me, and he took, he, he took a break after about 10 kilometers and went home. And uh, I just kept going. And uh, the only thing that kept me going was I was said to myself, I can't wait to put this on Facebook <laughs> and, and, and tell everyone I've done it. Um, but it was, and I got terribly sunburned and everything else, but it was, a, it, was just, it was just beautiful. But I really got to know myself and I was kind of pushing my limits. And it was after all that mental health stuff. So it was really kind of a, it, was, it wasn't really about the run. And um, I think, you know, if you went to the Dublin Marathon or um, I think there's one in Cork as well, um, yes. uh, you, you would find so many stories from people. They're not just doing it to, to, um, to make a good time, you know. They're doing it to remember someone. They're doing it for someone who's sick. They're doing it because maybe they've been overweight and they want to lose weight. Everyone has a story out there. And, um, and they're not the stories that, that define the people, but they're stories that define a part of their life. And... Um, you know, I, I met a man uh, who was after cycling from Cork to Longford uh, last week, and I said, "Why?" He said, "I'll tell you my story." And he said, uh, "We started talking, and he, and he said, well, my brother died a couple of years ago around this time, so I always go for a cycle around then.' And mm -hmm. I just think Martins are like that. People are there for other reasons, you yeah, know, and yeah. um, and it, that's the really deep thing about it because it's not a pleasurable thing to run 42 kilometers you know <laughs> there's nothing pleasurable about it like it's grand for a 10k is grand or whatever but it's when it gets to that there's nothing pleasurable it's but really intense it's yeah. really intense so you're doing it for you're doing it for a greater purpose than yourself you know yeah. and even the pros are they find it hard too you know um so yeah it's it's a it's you a have very this nice line thing. that it, people are running for something or from, from something. something? Yeah, 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 exactly. Um, got asked that question a lot, actually, in all the <laughs> interviews I did. And um, I suppose I was someone who was running from something. I was running from um, uh, bad mental health and, and a breakup and all this sort of stuff. And now I, I suppose I run for the joy and the enjoyment mm -hmm. of it, um, uh, not forgetting what I had went through yeah. um, but I think those those people on uh, on life's road uh, there there are many deep reasons and um, and I suppose that's why I like running you know it's, yeah. it's it's so much more than just one foot in front of the other yeah but it is about being in the moment at the same time then. it is yeah yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. it is and, and you know like you meet someone who is um, you meet someone who's maybe over... I remember the very first race I did, uh, um, a 60-odd-year-old man bet me, and, uh, and he said, you know, the thing to do now is keep running. And I said, why are you running? And he said, well, he said, I had cancer, and he said, I've, I recently beat it, and I wanted to do something for myself, you know? And it really just... Um, it really just taught me a lesson uh, in, in life, you know, mm -hmm. yeah, mm -hmm. in listening, you yeah. know? Yeah. Yeah. Do you want to read a little more? Yeah, sure. Um, I'll read a short chapter uh, or a little bit of a one. Um, how are we for time? Are we okay? So, with, yeah, it's 12.14. Oh, so yeah. Plenty of time. Yeah. Um, so, when I was in... Um, uh, when I was writing the book, I went to... Uh, it's a really f interesting thing, I suppose. I said to my friend, who's our parish priest, Father Sean... I said, I'm going to go and meet the Navajo Indians. 
And he said, and why are you going to do that? And I said, I don't know. I just said, I feel like I need to. And he said, well, hang on a second. And he went upstairs and he got, um, he came back down with a letter from a relation of mine who was a priest who had lived with the Navajo. And uh, then I read it and, it was, and there's a bit of it here which I'll read. It was a really beautiful letter. And uh, then I, it turned out that to the Navajo, running is a sacred act, and they start the day with a run. And I just said, well, now I have to go. And uh, <laughs> so, um, yeah, so this chapter is, is, is about that. But uh, um, it was an amazing time. And then what I did do when I was there was run around Monument Valley, which is the famous s stacks you see in all the cowboy movies. And, uh, um, yeah, and, and it, it was just a really really profound, deep sort of uh, trip. So I'll, I'll, I'll read it here. Uh, <clears throat> the Navajo. We are not alone in this post-colonial landscape. We have never been. It was on a run in America's heart of Arizona that I came face to face with a leader of the Navajo Native Americans and found something of ourselves reflected back. I had come to the Navajo reservation to run, for it is a sacred act here. The Navajo Nation is a big place, as big as Ireland. It is a land of milk and honey where beautiful desert plains give way to rolling grasslands. It is a special land. It stands alone as one of the few tribal nations to regain its homeland during the American Wars of Conquest. Why it was that they and not, say, the Apache or the Sioux returned home is not so clear, for, they were all the great, for all the great tribes fought as bravely as each other. The history of the American Inland Empire was founded on a lie, for its core principle of manifest destiny was the fiction of a newspaper editor. This destiny enshrined the right given by God to overspread and possess the whole of the North American continent. It was this credo that allowed for the great experiment of liberty to occur, namely the wars of conquest on the ever-expanding frontier. So successful was the ideology of manifest destiny that we can see it shape the Nazis' Lebensraum theory some 60 years later. It's, it's actually it's amazing. It's only 60 years between the frontiers and the Nazis, um, mm. the cowboys and the Nazis. But anyway, um, in both we see morally justified colonialism. In short, the act of dispossession devoid of guilt. That the Irish too took part in this experiment is not lost on me, for we were part of the great ride west. There was excitement in it for the people who went, but tragedy for the people who already lived there. Monument Valley is a sort of Mecca in the nation, a temple of nature with its cathedral of vast monolithic rocks rushing through the red desert soil. It is a religious and sacred space. My, one, my run was, I suppose, a pilgrimage to the Old West, to the west of the imagination, and yet it became a Camino in the way of Thoreau's transcendentalism, for the Creator's hand was everywhere visible in this place. Having camped under the desert stars the night before, I set off at 6 a.m. before the heat of the day could break me. The run was 27 long miles, and the winds of the Arizona and Utah plains swept the red sands as it descended into the park. They call this place Tsibisia Nagai, the Valley of the Rocks. It is a place that draws men to it, a place of magnetism that cannot be explained. In the quiet of the morning, I ran alone by stabled horses and soaring eagles high above. The Navajo legends of this place concern their own foundation story of their movement into the fourth world and how gods and monsters met here. They simply refer to themselves as the Dinna, the people, and all actions, even those of long ago, happened under Father Sky and Mother Earth. It was the same sky under which the Navajo began their long walk of 1864. Hunted by the US Colonel Kit Carson, a noted Indian killer, the tribe war, after a brave resistance, rounded up and forced to walk a 500 kilometer journey to a detention camp in New Mexico. Many died on the walk and more still in the camp. As I ran, I thought of that march and the fear that must have been in the hearts of the Navajo in the 18 day journey. It had, said, it had been said to me that it was heartbreak that killed Manny on their sad trail, a fear that they would never again see their homes. In their trek, I see too my own people's forced migration to this continent. As the Navajo battled warring US colonels, we fled our shores in the coffin ships of the Atlantic, bound for the harbors of New York to escape famine. As I rounded the great god Mesa, the rain god Mesa, I thought how vacant this valley would be of its people without its people, how the songs of this place very nearly died, and what then would become of the sacred. At the 20 mile mark, I began to loop 
around the great earthen road and turned back for the campsite. The sun was still rising and the heat of the day had not yet taken me. I was thirsty, but that was my only complaint. I breathed in the clean air and saw a jackrabbit break from the brush and vanish into the horizon. In the Navajo tradition, running creates a living cord between earth and heaven. It is a means of communication between the living, the dead, and the holy. I felt something of that as I passed through the scrubland and saw the landscape waken for the day. It was pristine and beautiful, a red oasis of serenity free of tourists at this hour. After four years in the detention camps of Bosque Redondo in New Mexico and at great cost to the Americans, the Navajo began negotiations with the US government and together General Sherman and Barboncito, their great leader, agreed to the return of the Dina to their four sacred mountains. It was not all of their once vast nation, but it was one of the few victories of native people in this country. Hot and weary, I saw the road for the camp and a wind blew and cooled me. It was the breath of the creator and I welcomed it. I ate breakfast in the shadow of the monoliths and packed my bags to meet a fellow runner, the Navajo Vice President, Jonathan Nez. Um, oh, uh, it's too long now, so I'll take a break. But, but that uh, letter uh, is really... I don't but, know, yeah, and I, yeah, I went and met the, the Vice President, who's now the President of the Navajo Nation, and um, he's actually a runner himself, so he really got the book. And he, and he said a really interesting thing to me. He said... Um, he said, you know, I am aware of the Irish story. And he said, I'm aware of what you went through. But he said, but you're a white person. Mm -hmm. And there was lots of ye around. And it was, it was really interesting because I, I, I hadn't known what to expect, you know. And, uh, and I suppose I had to realize that, of course, the Irish had went to the, to the West and, you know, colonized land. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was kind of a, it was a, moment of an awakening in a, in a oh, sense, really? you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. so yeah. you just don't think of it, you know, we, yeah. we always think we went to New York and that was it, we're the victims, <laughs> but we, we also took part in the story yes, of, of Manifest Destiny. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and the thing about the letter, I think there was some lovely line about their connection to the land. Yeah, I might actually read that because yeah, it is so... Who is it, it from it, again? It's from uh, Father Frank Gray, uh, who is my relation, and... Uh, he, he, he wrote this letter to Father Sean, and, um, and he talked about the Navajos. I, I wish I'd actually printed the whole letter, but... Uh, um, so I went... He, he, the letter was marked Crown, Crown, Point, uh, Crown Point Mission, and I went... I drove to the mission, and um, I met an old nun who was really surprised <laughs> to see me asking for a man that had been there 20 years before. She said, I remember Father Frank. And she brought me in, God, and uh, she brought me into their church, and that the Navajo had built with the Catholic Church, and there was the four sacred mountains in the, in the, um, in the, in the, in the nation, and they had taken stones from each of the four sacred mountains to build the altar, and uh, and and she said to me, some pe she said we get a lot of people come here, and she said some people don't know why they're here. And, and she said, but I think you know why you're here. <laughs> and uh, so this is Frank's letter about the links between the Irish and the Navajo. The Navajo don't seem to have an innate desire to master nature. This comes from an inherited caution and respect. Like the ancient Celts, they lavished their skills and endless patience into works of art, weaving jewelry, making pottery. The landscape is wild and free mostly desert with red and blue rocky mountains and little groups of houses here and there vanishing into the landscape, not standing out against it. It is the Indian way to want to pass through life without disturbing anything. The spirit of the earth, air and water are to be respected and the land and all it bears are treated with consideration. Corn, the fruit of the land, is sacred to the Navajo. They use it like holy water. In the morning at prayer, a devout Navajo holds a pinch of it in his hand. When finished praying, he sprinkles it on his path, puts a little pinch of it on top of his head for good luck and tastes it for good harmony. And uh, Father Frank finishes the letter with saying, in journeying to a distant world, one can see one's own world more clearly. Mm. And that was, I, I had to go to the, to the desert in America to understand uh, Longford in Ireland. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe Cork too. But <laughs> um, does anyone have any questions? Yeah, I'd like to ask John something. Both your occupations are very solitary. You're writing and you're running. Does it find that you, you, it puts you apart from people? 
Um, well, that's a great question. Um, I am a very social person, <laughs> and I I love chatting and I love uh, talking to people, and um, I uh, actually. Uh, if it wasn't for WhatsApp, I'd be very bored now because I can talk to my friends in other countries. Uh, they are, it's something that has, um, I like running on my own because I, I, I'm not very fast, so uh, it suits me. I, I do go running with people, but I'm always paddy last, so, uh, <laughs> so that kind of works out. But I do find it a solitary task, and it's funny, I actually spent the morning on, um, on, a, on a phone call and I'm working on a TV show with a friend, and, and he's a writer as well, and it's be, we were both saying how lovely um, it was to work with people because uh, it can be a it can be a very isolating thing and you know you you spend five or six hours a day on your own writing and luckily I'm married now so I bother my wife but uh, it's it's um, generally you know I wrote the cow book and I was staying with friends and I wrote this book and I was staying with friends and 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 the next book I wrote when my wife was there. I think I need people around me to bounce things off, and uh, and um, I have a group of friends who are all artists, but they all work in different fields. Like one's a photographer, one's a musician, and one's a filmmaker and stuff. And it's it's good because there's no egos, uh, and everybody's supporting everybody. But you're never really too worried about. Uh, uh, oh well, his book's going to come out, or you know, there's, that competition isn't there, so it's it's really good. But I, I do. I had come from making documentaries, which is entirely collaborative, and as a journalist working as an investigative journalist working with teams and editors and everything. So I have found it. I have found it hard, and I do miss. Uh, I do miss that crack. So I, I'm kind of trying to put things in place now to to work with other people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm. Anyone else? From what you read, I have not read your book yet because I just bought it now this morning. But from what you read, I think you are also a poet. You didn't mention that. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> you're very nice to say that. I've tried to write poetry, but I don't know all the rules. Um, my, my mentor uh, is David Malouf, who's an Australian writer. And uh, David actually started as a poet and, and now writes books and, and he's retired and just writes poetry again. And I've asked him on different times to try and teach me about poetry because I, I, do, I do think it's a beautiful art form. Um, um, but then I read someone like um, Stephen Sexton or uh, Ocean Vung and um, I... Uh, I said to myself, oh, it's going to take a long time to get that good, you know. But I, I do like poetry, yeah. Yeah, but why do you try to compare yourself to someone else? You can be your own poet. Oh, of course, yeah. I don't know, human nature. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I yeah, it's, that's a great question. Um, we shouldn't, you know, I was... My wife was saying that to me yesterday. She said, uh, she said just be yourself, you know. And uh, uh, when I... Uh, when I was writing these books, um, she said a great thing to me. She said, uh, the world is a very strange place at the moment. And, and this was in the Trump era too, it was even stranger then. And she said, people crave authenticity. And she said, your books are very authentic. Mm -hmm. She said, that's the thing. You should you know, keep, keep writing about that because that's what you know. And um, in a way, I suppose, uh, I've, I've finished a short story collection earlier in the year, and uh, they're all mo they're all set in rural Ireland. And uh, you know, I tried to write one or two in cities because I have lived in cities, but I it's so long ago now that uh, what was authentic to me was was to write about that. And funnily enough, I was here in 2018 uh, with the cow book, and I was I'd never been to Bantry before, and I was looking out at the harbour. And there's land over on the right-hand side, and there was a farmer with sheep. And this whole idea for a novella came to me, and it's called The Ram. And uh, it's in this book, and I, I, um, uh, I, I owe that story to Bantry. And uh, it's, it's one of my favorite things I've ever wrote. It's about a farmer who has a, um, a, little, a little lamb is born, and the mother dies, and he becomes, he's a bram lamb, and he becomes this prize-winning lamb that everyone gets jealous of. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, it's, it, there's a little girl in the story as well. But uh, I, I, was, I was 
I came in yesterday evening and I was looking at the field and I said, I said, I wonder, will he be back again, this farmer? Will I get another story from him? So um, it's amazing where stuff comes from. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. It kind of reminds me, of, I think it was Brian Friel or one of the members of Field Day said it, that we're writing stories for ourselves yeah. and hoping other people over here. Yeah. Yeah, well, I, I'm a huge fan of uh, Brian Friel and Field Day. And uh, um, I actually have a tattoo of... <laughs> oh, no <laughs> of, way. It's all over and it's all about to begin from uh, Philadelphia, here oh, I no come, way. on my chest. <laughs> like, it's very, very tastefully done now. It's not, a, it's not a massive gang symbol or anything. But uh, yeah, well, that's it. You, you have to write um, for yourself and hopefully other people will... Will, will connect, you know, yeah, and, uh, yeah. and that's what this book was. Uh, I think I had to write it to write something else and uh, to write the, the last book and uh, um, uh, um, you hope people will come on the journey and, uh, you know, and people have, uh, th thousands of people have with the book. Um, it's, it's, uh, it's, um, it's a mad thing really, you know, it's a crazy thing. You, you, you write these books and this is why it's so lovely to have a festival because, um, you know, the book came out in October and there hasn't been anything on. So you never meet anybody. So you don't know if people have connected with it. And yeah. the great thing, my favorite thing about the cow book uh, and that year was the festivals because you met people and you said, you had a chat and you say, oh, well, I connected with this or I read this bit or, or you met other writers whose books you like. But COVID has been... You know, it's been cruel like that, cruel you know. To and, writers, uh, yeah. I mean, it's it's been cruel to everybody. I shouldn't mm. complain, mm. but but um, uh, you do miss that connection, yeah. you know. Uh, yeah. It's what yeah. it gives you the fuel, you know. Yeah. It yeah. gives you the fuel to keep yeah. going. I think. Yeah. Any other questions? Hmm. No, I don't think so. Yeah. I mean, there's. It reminded me a bit of McGahern, John McGahern as well. I think you mentioned him in yeah. the book. Yeah. Yeah. We would have. You know, it's funny, we were in the mart uh, selling some lambs uh, about three weeks ago and um, the mart auctioneer uh, said to me, um, he said, uh, my father said, uh, this is the man that wrote the cow book and he said, he said, well, he said, it's great to meet you. I used to shear sheep for John McGarn <laughs> and, uh, and uh, he told me about... I've never met John. My my father knew him and and uh, from the mart and stuff, but I, I was too young. But uh, he he told me this story about. Uh, he said, yeah. He said John had loads of French people over because he was very popular in France, McGarn, <laughs> and he had a lot of French people over. And he said he was quite he was quite tipsy, and the men were shearing the sheep. And he came out and he said, ah, never mind about that. You come and have a drink with us. <laughs> 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 and I think people think John McGarren was very, you know, so, so somber. So somber but, yeah. but from what I've heard from people, uh, he was, you know, he was, he was a jovial very man. Very convivial. Very convivial, yeah, 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 yeah. A very yeah. jovial yeah. man. Yeah. And, you know, I think um, with his books, because they're all, uh, they're, I haven't read all of them. I've, uh, I haven't read The Pornographer, but, uh, but um, you know, there is a serious side to them. But I think... It was actually Colm Tobin said to me, he said, no, he said he was just on a vein of, that was his vein that he worked in, you know. Yeah. It wasn't actually the man, you know. And uh, yeah, it's one of my great regrets that I never got to yeah. meet him. But, yeah. but he sort do? of mapped his locality in this He did, way, yeah, really. he did, you know. And, yeah. and, 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 you know, he was the one who talked about that the local is the universal. And, uh, you know, when I first came home, I would have read a lot of McGarn and, and his short stories and... Uh, and they did a great, after he died, they released a wonderful um, book. I can't think of the name of, uh, the name of it, but it's all his prose writing, all his non-fiction writing. And oh, it's absolutely fascinating. It's brilliant. He was, he was so astute and clever and, um, yeah, great shame I never got to meet him. But <laughs> anyway, yeah, he's a great hero of mine. Yeah. Well, um, uh, I think um, we'll, if there's no more questions, we'll wrap up um, and just if we just give John a big round of applause and thank you for <laughs> a wonderful Thanks, work. Everyone.